We are now on episode 5, chapter 5 of 10 Days That Unexpectedly Changed America. Chapter 5 is on the homestead, homestead strike. Uh, in this chapter, you uh, get an insight into a little bit of the saga throughout American history of uh, the working class, working class democracy, uh, its rise and its troubles, uh, which uh, the focal point, according to this chapter, was at Homestead, Pennsylvania, in July of 1892. Um, just tensions between workers, both individually and collectively, as they formed unions, uh, tension with them and management, or those who owned uh, factories. Uh, so you have, during this time period, uh, workers joining together in unions, fighting for higher wages, better working conditions, uh, control of the factories and the factory towns, and those like Carnegie, who will be the central figure in this chapter, the big business owners uh, wanting to control and manage that labor to increase their profit. Um, that's a, just a bit of an overview or summary but to get into the details of what the chapter uh, covers, uh, the Homestead factory was a steel plant near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and in this steel plant that was owned and managed by an Andrew Carnegie and kind of his second in command, kind of his henchman who did some of the dirty work, uh, was Henry Clay, Henry Clay Frick. So Carnegie and Frick are on the management or the business side. In terms of the labor, those steel workers that lived at Homestead near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there were about 3,800 of them, and they had formed a very powerful union. Uh, and they were negotiating for control of the, of, of the factory in terms of better wages, better conditions, them having a voice in the way the factory and the town around the factory that they and their families lived in. Uh, Carnegie and Frick were determined to break the power of this union. Uh, on July 29, 1892, uh, with Carnegie's permission, Henry Clay Frick shut down the Homestead plant, and their plan was to hire workers, other workers, uh, non-union workers that would have been referred to as scabs, to come in and to work for cheaper, thus breaking uh, the amalgamated steel union of workers at Homestead. Uh, the workers and their families did not leave Homestead uh, when the factory was shut down. Uh, they armed themselves to the best of their ability and were just going to conduct a strike until Carnegie and Frick gave in so they could get better wages and better conditions. Uh, but uh, Carnegie and Frick weren't going to have anything to do with that. They were determined to break the strike, and it goes into a couple of phases of how that takes place. At first, if you read through this chapter, hopefully you did, they hired uh, independent uh, Pinkertons, uh, kind of hired detectives, hired guns, uh, who would just hire themselves out to whoever would pay the most money uh, to do their bidding for them. In this case, these Pinkertons, these detectives, are hired to come in and to break up this union. Uh, and on July the 6th, 1892, the Pinkertons sought to uh, get off their barges on the Mohongahela River outside of the homestead plant, uh, 300 or so workers to unload load and to break up uh, this strike. Uh, but on this day, the striking workers, some 3,000 uh, 3, of them, resisted and the Pinkertons ended up surrendering. And in the process of that fighting, three Pinkertons and seven workers were killed, so there was some violence. Uh, at that point, you have a bit of a transition or a pause uh, in the chapter, uh, labor, the homestead strikers, won this battle, but then it shifts into the bigger question, who ultimately won the war between workers and labor unions and big labor uh, and big business owners like Andrew Carnegie. Uh, so it shifts gears a little bit, or return to what happened uh, at, at Homestead later in the chapter, but the chapter, after kind of giving an overview of the battle with the Pinkertons, just went in and discussed in general terms 
the industrialization that took place in the United States in the years following the American Civil War. So you're talking 1870s to the turn of the century is when the U.S. became industrialized. Uh, factories being built uh, across the nation, particularly in the Northeast, a move towards cities, etc. These types of things were taking place and workers began to kind of lose their independent identity that they would have had in years past where they were individual craftsmen, they would have made things, had pride in their work, etc. As a result of industrialization, you have a standardization of labor. A worker's doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, not a whole lot of skill is required to do uh, the job here. So workers are losing their identity. Those who own these factories are trying to uh, make labor cost very low uh, because the owners wanted to increase their profit. Uh, so you begin to see uh, the struggle of skilled workers. Of course, unskilled workers had their struggles as well. Uh, but skilled workers are beginning to kind of be uh, pushed out as unneeded uh, because of industrialization. Factories, machines uh, can do the work and you just need labor uh, to do fairly simple uh, tasks. The workers, as we loop back to Homestead, the steel workers at Homestead uh, were, in fact, skilled workers. That's the way they viewed themselves. But Carnegie was convinced, and he was partly right, that their skilled labor was not needed. So he really wanted to break their power and hire cheaper, unskilled labor uh, is definitely what he wanted to do. So when they began to negotiate a contract, um, uh, and Carnegie and Frick won't give it to them. That's when the steel workers go on strike. Pinkertons are called in, uh, and the laborers defeat the Pinkertons. But then you pick up uh, kind of the completion of the story. Uh, who is the government going to support? State governments and the national government. Are they going to back these labor unions, or are they going to back those who own factories, uh, the big um, industrialists like Carnegie and J.P. Morgan uh, and uh, Gould, a number of these uh, major business owners that we'll talk about in class. Well, the end story, the bottom line is government is going to back business owners, those who own factories, not the workers. Uh, what happened as uh, we begin to kind of wrap up here is after the Pinkertons were defeated by the labor union on Ju July 11th, 8,000, uh, not 300 Pinkertons, but now 8,000 Pennsylvania National Guardsmen arrive and are sent in to Homestead. As you might expect, these troops armed with weapons, cannons, etc., uh, they are able to break up this strike in three days um, and other workers who will work for much less uh, money are brought in and they take the place of those who had been striking uh, trying to get better conditions, better hours, better wages uh, at Homestead. Um, the labor unions uh, across the country, particularly at Homestead, were hurt even more around the same time that this strike is taking place and as it's being busted up when an anarchist, those who are against government, uh, very anti-big business as well, and Alexander Berkman, a Russian anarchist, tried to kill Henry Clay Frick. Uh, Carnegie's right hand man. He was unsuccessful but the labor unions were linked to that. It wasn't particularly unfair. It was an anarchist who did this but labor's now being connected with violence and unrest. So labor unions going to kind of lose its support from the government and in some ways from the population at large because of this violence. Um, so what you have in terms of a bottom line, what's the bottom line of all this in this chapter? It's this. There's a strong alliance that ends up being formed between big business and government. The government is going to back big business, big business owners, not labor, not labor unions. So this temporarily uh, dooms 
uh, the cause of labor. It's going to come back. Labor unions are going to come powerful in the 20th century, perhaps too powerful. That would be a great uh, discussion to have. But what happens at Homestead and its aftermath dooms labor unions and the rights of workers for centuries. And what happened at Homestead, again, a big steel industry allowed labor costs to be reduced, which allowed steel to be produced very cheaply and easily. And the United United States becomes the leading producer of steel, uh, and these big uh, business owners make a lot of money, uh, but as the book expresses, that money was made, and America becomes industrialized, at least in part, uh, at the price being paid by workers and their low wages. Uh, that is what Chapter 5 uh, deals with, uh, at least in summary form.